A vote kicked Illuminati, which probably wouldn't get me any friends. Nah, someone didn't agree. Nah, nah, that's probably a bad idea, actually. Get the boom! Get the boom boom! For some reason, I quite liked Silver Haze. He reminded me of Beta Killer. Maybe it reminded me of the Counter-Strike Source days. You see, I was in charge of a clan. We played for several years and consisted mainly of close friends. However, at one point some people left and I needed to find some more people. So I went on a, a surf map and asked if anyone wanted to join a clan. And Beta Killer replied. Lovely Beta Killer. He was like 12 at the time or something. He was really young, but he sounded terrifying. He'd sort of mumble into the mic and occasionally swear. And whenever we lost a clan match, he'd attack the other players. Oh, the amount of trouble he got us into, but we loved him so much. He was the one loyal player we had until the end. I wonder what happened to him. It all started off with Tommy TTK's older brother. He was super pro at Unreal Tournament. He set up a small Counter-Strike Source clan, and Tommy TTK and all of his friends, including me, joined. We weren't that good, but we had fun. We would play on the clan base ladders. They were small and looked down on by other leagues, but we enjoyed the games, and there was one clan that dominated the rest. It was known as Team Lycanthropy. One of the players, named Toku, uploaded demos of all of the matches. I loved watching those videos. I'd analyse every kill he made and promised myself that one day I would be as good as he was. I didn't stalk him, but I did add him to MSN and I followed all of his games, tried joining games when he was in them, and generally followed him about the place and painted pictures of him. The first conversations I had with him were really nice. He was a nice guy, though it wasn't long before he tried to get away from me. People in the clan would joke that I loved him and stuff like that, but it wasn't like that. It was just pure admiration for him. I started pretending to be him in games. I'd start wearing makeup and... Anyway, I'm telling you all this because he was amazing. I once managed to get onto a game with him. It was an aim map, and everybody was accusing him of hacking. Now you know like people accuse you occasionally of hacking. Every server he went on, people said he hacked. He didn't. He later joined Team Logitech, but he left soon after because he must have just been too good for everybody else. I don't know what happened after that. Long story short, I once managed to break into one of the matches he was playing in and shot him in the face with a Glock. Oh, wait, what's that music? <gasps> Could it be that time again? Yes, children, it's time for another story from the past. The distant past. I'm a very nostalgic person, especially about my Counter-Strike days. 2005 was pretty much the end of school for me, and JD was a group of friends who played Counter-Strike. Now, I started playing the game because half of 2 deathmatch got too easy. Forget the ping, just look at the score. And also forget that I've just died. I don't know how that happened. But in short, I played Counter-Strike for a challenge, and it was great fun. I don't even remember how we got all our members now, but we did. In 2005, the original Counter-Strike still had a big following, and you could almost feel it. You could tell that there were these pros who had been playing for five years, but it was a game that we steered well clear of. A bit like how people steer clear of Counter-Strike Source today. Tom's brother led us by the hand through the ladders. He had had experience from the years before in Unreal Tournament and knew how things worked. And he got us off to a good start and got a server and everything like that. It was exciting. Our very own server. Now, I've talked about our teammate Beta Killer and how I stalked Toku for a while, but so many other things happened as well. It was a genuinely brilliant time of our lives. We were unstoppable. It was probably because everybody else was playing the game at about 15 frames a second, but we dominated everything. Apart from the ladders, that was difficult. But publicly, cool, and that's all that mattered. However, problems began to arise. Tom and his brother began to go AFK. I tried commanding the team for a while, but I didn't have full access to the server or team speak, which made it difficult when people tried to take it over. In clan matches, we'd win against people who would then claim that they won, and we'd get into these petty arguments that were gone for months. One person managed to get the number one place in the UK and was too scared to play against us, so they kept on recommending that we played them next year. We were childish at the time, but everybody else. Oh my god. In school, we had a rival clan that we fought against. It was like gang warfare, but really nerdy. They were called the KK. As much as we loathed each other, we kind of enjoyed it. But sadly, World of Warcraft started claiming our players. It wasn't long before it took over everything. Also, people were having a go at us because there was a famous person named JD, and they thought that we were copying them and trying to get to fame with that name. I had had enough. I rounded up the remaining players in JD and discussed a new clan. None of us could agree on a name. I was always rubbish with names. So instead, we came up with the initials GPX. What did it stand for? No one knew, but it was a mystery that kept the clan together for the next couple of years. In JD, we were just getting started. GPX was the real deal. See, I so should have killed them both there. And when I'm playing, I don't have anyone to moan to. It wasn't always like that. Back in the day, we had TeamSpeak. 
Well, some of us did, others had Ventrilo, there was like a battle between the two. Ventrilo was better, far more functional, had better sound quality, whilst TeamSpeak made everybody sound like a robot. I preferred TeamSpeak. At first we'd find random ones without anybody in, and we'd take it over until the original owner came back. That was always funny. However, once we got a proper Counter-Strike server, we also got a TeamSpeak server thrown in. We were gods. Apart from Betakiller, the only other person who stayed from the beginning to the very end of Counter-Strike was Phalanx. Now he didn't really play the game too well. He was more of the clan secretary, and he was lovely, he's like the nicest guy I've ever met. It wasn't the same without him, he designed the logos, he even had a database set up for the clan. I don't know what was on there. One day he happened to be on TeamSpeak when he started singing, so I recorded it and mixed it into a song. What a lovely guy, he thought it was hilarious. Anyway, so back to the TeamSpeak server itself. At first the only admin was Tom, and he was boring with it. He wouldn't give it to anybody or anything because he was afraid that something bad would happen. I was all like, no nah, it won't, give it to me. And before he knew it, I'd given it to everybody else. And we were all banned from the server by a teammate. Anyway, later on I was in GPX and I was a lot more careful about it. I gave it to my closest friends and the highest ranking people in the clan, and this guy called Thinkfast. The very mention of his name strikes terror into the heart of people in the clan. Now I'm afraid I don't have many pictures to show you here, so it'll just be random stuff on the screen. And because of this, Thinkfast has become a bit of a legend. He was a good player, and his mum had just died, so we cut him some slack. However, one of my friends came round to my house and played on my computer, and he started shouting down the team speaker at him, talking about how he had his mum. Now this was a kind of recurring joke at the time with the clan, and he shouldn't have taken it seriously, and he should have noticed it wasn't me. But he didn't. But it wasn't just admin rights to TeamSpeak he had. Oh no. It was also to the game server. He deleted it. Needless to say, he was quickly kicked out of the clan, and fortunately Tom had a backup of the entire server, which he re-uploaded. Yeah, I know, he's good like that. Oh, thank goodness that song's finished. Like all great supervillains, he swore he would get revenge, and left a load of insulting comments before leaving on TeamSpeak. Once again, I recorded them and mixed them into a song. I don't give a fuck what I did to your server, you fucking deserved it. Tom's brother also made a remix, and together I think that we gave him a mental breakdown. Look, look, we don't have all the people. No, we don't rush, we don't rush. Don't rush! The fucking retarded! Oh my god. Man, you are retarded or what? So yeah, not the nicest person in the world. But am I any better? And uh, just forget the series for a second. I mean, as a person, I think I'm about the same. Watching a video like this just makes me ashamed and embarrassed. I can understand how he feels. He wants to win. He just doesn't admit it. He plays to win, he doesn't play to have fun. It's the price you have to pay if you want to go pro. And I can sit and laugh at this, I mean, I'm doing this series for a laugh. It's fun. But I still get that same urge to shout at people. I had friends who played Counter-Strike, but I'd get frustrated, because I was better than them. I'd play harder and longer, and ultimately, I wanted to get better at the game. Things with my friends started so well. We made machinimas, messed around on public servers. I even made a fake skill video that switched to solitaire halfway through. But it was time that we went our separate ways. I was getting angry and frustrated when I lost because of them, and they were annoyed that I only ever played competitively. The straw that broke the camel's back was when I was on TeamSpeak with someone called Dylan. He was someone several years below us in school. I never got on with him, I didn't really like him. My friends on the other hand, did. One time when I was playing Counter-Strike he went on the TeamSpeak server and started playing music in the background to annoy me. I shouted some abuse at him, he got all the voice samples and gave it to my friends. I wonder where that's happened before. Anyway, I didn't see it as a joke and got very angry. In fact, it was the first time in my life I felt proper anger. I felt betrayed. I was the one trying to keep the clan together. I was getting clan matches that people didn't turn up to. I had all the problems with the server, and yet people would just make fun of me. It was time for an adventure. For a while, I joined Us3. It was a clan at the top of the ladders at the time, and it had that air of mystery because it was so high up. However, I joined it and realised that I was actually better than all of them. It's just that they worked together as a team. I was young at the time and quite scared of other people, so I left again. I was a bit of a loner. My friends would all play on Office with 40 people fighting it out. It never appealed to me. I would go on IRC and find random mixes. I never made any friends, and I didn't want to, I just wanted to get better. Eventually I realised that that meant joining a clan. Of course, I was also in GPX at the time. It's always awkward when you're in two at the same time because you join a clan match and you've got the wrong tag on and everyone's like <gasps> But nothing ever happened from it. 
I looked on the ladders and found a clan called Imageless. Now they were good. Now in the clan that my friends were in, GPX, we had too many players for one team. It was annoying to play in proper clan matches and to lose because we had some bad people playing, so we split them out into the good players and the bad players. But then people didn't like being in Team 2, so for a while we switched it around so Team 2 was actually the best one with all the best players. Anyway, Imageless did kind of the same thing. Team 1 was amazing, but it hardly ever played. Team 2 was the one that got the clan's name recognised and had all the matches. Finally, I could get better. There was just one problem. Kimura. He was one of their strongest players. He played to win. He was hardcore. He was a good player. But he hated me. I was just this random person who had come along and joined his group, and he didn't like it. Maybe he saw me as a threat. He would rage in games. Every time we started losing, he would blame it on me. It was always my fault. My fault! And I wasn't the bottom of the team most of the time. But I wasn't exactly the highest either. I couldn't believe my ears when he was shouting at me. I, I was looking at everyone else, thinking, well, why aren't you standing up for me? He's clearly in the wrong. But they didn't. He was clearly better established than I was. And then it struck me. This was revenge for how I treated Dylan. But then again, I never team killed someone in a proper league match. Or did I? I, I can't remember. I don't quite know what happened with me in that clan. I think I just slowly faded away. I returned to GPX. I was better, I was wiser, and I had more experience of what was required to run a clan. We did away with GPX. I merged us with the rival school clan, KK. This gave us lots of new members. We were all keen to do well, and Dissolutions was the peak of our Counter Strike Source success. But that's for next time. As for Dylan, I think he challenged me to a Command & Conquer 3 match at some point. He won, and I never heard of him again. I guess that was good closure for him. So yeah, I can't stay mad at these angry players, because inside, I'm one of them. I'm competitive, and I'm not very nice. What people like me experience isn't proper anger, it's just sheer frustration. But we are still fucking annoying to play with. Now it's time to go back to the past. I'll be talking about my times in Counter-Strike Source in a minute, but first, let's go back even further. Back to the mid-90s. You might have realised that the music in this series is kind of strange. That first song you heard was mine. This song is my dad's. I would listen to him late at night when I was trying to get to sleep. He would be up in the loft playing on his synthesizers, and they'd all sound kind of like this. I think it shaped my music taste, and that's why I make such strange things to this day. I didn't want to see all my dad's music disappearing, so I got all of his old cassette tapes and digitised them. I do this with every bit of my life, and it's only because of this that this series is possible. All of the pictures and old videos are from my archives. In a way, I wish that I'd recorded more. I've lost a lot over the years. But the more you record, the less mysterious it gets, and the less nostalgic you feel. The story of my Counter-Strike Source days is coming to a close. This video will contain the last bit, and the most exciting. We started in JD. We then reformed into GPX. I went my own way for a while, and then came back. We united the two great clans of our school, and made Dissolutions. As usual, we had trouble thinking up a name. We all wanted different things, so we came up with a nice clan logo, and got the name from that. I don't think any of us knew what Dissolutions was at the time, although, considering the rate at which all the old clans were dissolving, it was quite suitable. I remember that first night. There were about ten of us, and we all raided this big public server. We were part of something important. We had a new logo, and a fresh start. We could pave our destiny. We felt like the big boys in town. We dominated everybody, even the lesser skilled members among us. Those from GPX provided the skill. Those from the KK clan provided lots of members, and a huge amount of motivation. With this newfound power, I signed up to the leagues. We dominated the clans that used to beat us. The sense of progression was amazing. On clan base, we had never been number one, but things were about to change. We had two different teams, and we swapped it around quite a bit. We had a couple of fake accounts, so people in Team 1 could also play in Team 2. We weren't afraid to fight dirty. We had been playing by the rules for too long. I had learned a thing or two from the other clans I had been in, and I put it to practice for this one. Dissolutions was a work of art. Finally, we were where we wanted to be. At the top of the ladder. This picture is the crowning achievement of my Counter-Strike Source days. People will dismiss clan base as nothing important and full of rubbish players, but we don't care. That was our story. We paved our way, and we reached the top. Sure, we had people from outside our school, but this was a school-based clan. Friends who played for fun, but were also decent. Unfortunately, it doesn't sound like much when you put it on a CV, but I was very proud of being a clan leader, and learned a lot in the role about team management and just how difficult it can be. By now, it was about 2007. Cal Strike Source was beginning to lose out to rivals such as Call of Duty, and we felt like the latecomers to the scene. We were like Rocky in his latest video, but it didn't matter. We had done it. However, there were problems brewing on the horizon. Darkness took me, and I strayed out of thought and time. 
as my vision faded, I began to have flashbacks of my life. Conveniently, it was of the downfall of Dissolutions. It wasn't a quick thing. Dissolutions was strong for a long time, but people began to lose interest. I was now in my second year of college, and most people had started moving on. My friends were leaving for university and didn't have time for computer games anymore. Other people in the clan would hang out with other clans in their spare time. There was no social life to Dissolutions. It became just a name. There was no reason to stay. The moment we lost a match, all of a sudden I saw my team members jumping to that clan. It was heartbreaking, and I felt betrayed. As a clan leader, you've got to expect things like that. There were some people who would join in groups, and you knew that the moment that one left, the rest would as well. Occasionally it was worth having them just because they had a bit of skill, but it became cold and mechanical. It wasn't a fun thing anymore. Several of our members were accused of hacking, and I myself had my suspicions. They weren't particularly good players, it's just that you could never creep up on them. If you were hiding in a weird spot, they'd conveniently check that spot. I donned a different username and followed them on public servers. And sure enough, one of them at the end of the round, after everybody had died, looked towards a door and shot through it, hitting a window on the other side of the map in all four corners. He dropped his guard. He was hacking, but it was the most stupid proof I've ever had of hacking. Ever. At one point our team speak got hacked. It was because one of the server admins had the same username and password. I won't say who it was, but let's just say the password was Dylan. But I'm proud to say that despite all this, Dissolutions went out with a bang. The fighting spirit didn't end until the end. We were always down one good player. If we had a 5v5, we'd have four decent players. 2v2, we'd have one decent player. And so on. It's almost as if someone was missing from my life who should have been there. Then of course, there would be conflicts between the good players in the clan. Childish insults would go back and forth. And what do you do? Do you take one side? Do you take the other? Do you just leave them to it? Whatever you do, as clan leader, you lose. It wasn't all fun and games. Some people who I was very fond of would leave the clan for others, and then challenge ours to a battle. If they beat us, they insulted us. The clip shown here is of one such match. I'd been really good friends with the person for ages, and he left without warning and suddenly became nasty towards me. I was shocked and didn't really want to lose against his new clan. And we didn't. This round in particular put me in a good mood all day. Our final match couldn't have been more perfect. We were defending our number one spot on the clan base 2v2 UK ladder, and we were up against ESX Force, number two in the UK at that time, on that ladder, on clan base. Now the other matches we had were against people so immature they'd find any excuse to get the win even if we beat them. Oh, your clan tags didn't match. Oh, this person played and he only joined clan base after we challenged you. Oh, you only have four players and we have five, therefore we win straight away by default. Oh, you joined the server ten minutes late, we win. Oh, we passworded the server so you couldn't join, we win. But ESX Force were nice. They even postponed the 2v2 match because I couldn't find someone to play with. After a couple of days of trying to find someone, but to no avail, I challenged them to a 2v1. A true rocky scenario. Would I win? Of course not, but I did a fairly good job. I lost 21-9 and then folded the clan. Do you remember Thinkfast? You know, the guy whose mum died, someone insulted him and he took it out on our clan? Yeah, that Thinkfast. He became part of everything. He was a legend to us. Look, there's his influence right there. Anyway, we saw him once more. Only once. But first, just to irritate you, let's go back even further. Back to 2001, that'll be it. I played Unreal Tournament, against bots. I was really low, and we're talking probably skilled or experienced level bots here. And I played it for years. I downloaded every map and model I could, and bear in mind that back in the day it took about 10 minutes to download a megabyte. With my computer time allowance, anything beyond about 10 megabytes was out of reach for me. There are a lot of disappointing things I downloaded, but there was one brilliant map that stood out. CTF UI. Not quite sure how to pronounce it, but it was awesome. Whilst most Unreal Tournament maps focused on boxy rooms and corridors and indoor boring places, UI was a whole island. It had water, it had lava, it had random houses you could hide in, it had crates you could shoot. Not many maps had that. I admired the person who made it, even though looking back, it's kind of amateurish. I believe that the person who made it then went on to Second Life and sells castles for tens of thousands of dollars, so he's doing well for himself. A lot of you may know me for mapping, and I got into mapping because of this map. I wanted to make something like it. Alas, I didn't like the Unreal Editor. It wasn't until 2004 when Half-Life 2 came out that I could start mapping properly. I did some silly little tests, but I never finished anything. And then Counter-Strike came out, and it had bot support. <gasps> I could now play maps that I made with other people. Sort of. And from there it just advanced. I started making tutorials because I thought, well, if I'm never going to finish anything, my skills will just go to waste. Why not teach other people who may be able to finish it? 
Because of my mapping, I may have prioritised having a clan server slightly higher than other people, but we had hours of fun playing on them. Other people in the clan, including Betakiller, started making maps of their own which we all played for hours on end. What amazed me was how the maps never turned out as you planned, but they'd be fun in some other way. This Gib Valley one had sloped sides which people ended up surfing around and that became the main focus of the map, so I added ramps everywhere and it was really good. So good in fact that I remade it for CSGO. Splat Valley. Beta Killer, of course, made a sick twisted map where you were stuck in a pitch back basement with shotguns and you had to run around all these crates firing at people in the darkness. <laughs> it was a massacre. I don't want to talk about it. Later on I started making defuse maps. I remember people were on this server all day and I was updating it constantly with newer versions based on feedback. It was the most productive mapping day I ever had. My particular highlight was when Toku came on to playtest it. <laughs> oh, the memories. At one point Enemy Down was looking for mappers to make some maps for their league and it was because of this picture that they accepted me. I don't think it was too successful but at one point we all went on a server and tested this map. I think it was D-Autumn or D-Season or something like that. What I wanted to do was a damn map, and it spurred me into action with the first couple of attempts. It was a map that I remade really so many times over the years, and it eventually became D Tagivasati, which is probably my favourite map that I've ever made. What's funny is that normally when I look back at a map that I've made, I can remember everything I was listening to, everything I ate, what time of the year it was, and everything when I made it. But this map is a mystery, and yet despite that, it's got even more items placed in it than my later maps, which look far more complex. Weird. So what's Thinkfast got to do with this? Well, when we were playtesting this map at this stage on the server, guess who randomly joined? That's right, Thinkfast, over a year after he deleted our server and ran away. He also had a brand new Steam ID because apparently the last one got banned. What a great guy. This was in the autumn days of Dissolutions, when I was at the peak of my Counter-Strike Source skill. I was on the server with Dr Kapow and my 2v2 buddy Tiddles. Thinkfast didn't stand a chance, though he did put up a pretty good fight. I just wish that he was that good when he was in our clan, without the hacks obviously. I recorded the whole thing with Source TV, and to this day, I'm still not sure if he was wall hacking, but there were some fairly suspicious bits. Anyway, it didn't matter. It was a nice little bit of closure. I made it into this video, the full version of which can be found in the description of this video, so you can make your mind up for yourself if he was hacking or not. The video itself was the first thing I ever uploaded online. It was to Google Video, because I preferred it over YouTube at the time, but I later uploaded it to Two Clicks Philip. The rivalry we had with Thinkfast was very gentlemanlike. We respected each other and we enjoyed the element of right and wrong that it brought to the table. These sort of things made the Counter-Strike days far more enjoyable. I was so happy to see him that one last time that I decided to name that version of the map after him. And so concludes my encounters with Thinkfast. Somewhere out there, he's still around, doing something. But to me, he will always remind me of Counter-Strike. Thank you, Thinkfast. The CTs could only look down at the street below and wonder who was going to clear this mess up. But this guy on the right, Jimmy, began thinking deeply. He wondered why man has such a fascination with heights, about building bigger and taller structures, about climbing from the lowest dungeon to the highest peak before flinging himself and others off at the top. He thought that it would make for a great Counter-Strike map. Perhaps there could be a mini-game where players had to climb something tall. Unfortunately for him, it had already been done. By me with my FY Island Domination map. It was made back in the days of Dissolutions and before I started posting tutorials on YouTube. It was inspired by that other new live map for Unreal Tournament that I spouted endlessly about in Season 2's finale. It was kind of like Battlefield, where players would choose their profession and would spawn with various weapon types before trying to take over nodes on the map that they could then spawn from in the future. It was amazing in deathmatch mode. There was a working tank that mucked up all the time, moving bridges, beautiful views, but nobody cared about that. All people cared about was that mountain and how they could climb it. Screw my attempts at crafting a brand new game mode, I'm not bitter about it. Or am I? Anyway, that mountain. It doesn't look like much from far away, but the views from the top were great. Here I am, climbing up that secret path around the back of the mountain. You had to jump over some gaps, over a physics bridge, avoid the rock falls slightly further up, and you'd be rewarded with an amazing view and an orb at the top, making you master of the map. It taught me a great deal about mapping and I saw the massive potential for a game mode that worked in this checkpoint deathmatch style format. Sadly, I never made another map in this style and it faded into obscurity, but that didn't stop me from taking numerous friends up this mountain over the years. I think that at one point I even showed it to a woman. I'm such a romantic. But yeah, just one of the many strange and overly ambitious things that I worked on over the years that didn't fruit into anything. That's not to say that all of my maps were like that. 
In fact, there was one map that created a new game mode type and was played by hundreds, if not thousands of players. But I think I'll leave that for next week. It's time to go back to the past, one last time. Back to the days of CSS when I had just started playing. Back then we were like sheep, mindlessly shooting people with no greater goal in mind. Playing the game for fun's sake. Those were the days. But then, one fateful day, one of my friends sent me a link over Xfire of Dirty Secrets skill video. His aim, his reflexes. We caught a glimpse of the mysterious high-skilled community on CSS and it changed everything forever. Suddenly, skill videos were the thing that everybody was talking about. I watched Dirty Secret and JD performing the impossible in seemingly every clip. People online would argue over who was better and would aspire to be the next top orper. Not a lot's changed, really. Anyway, I went on a public server and made my own frag video to rule them all. It didn't exactly turn the world on its head, but that didn't stop myself and all of my friends from trying. KK Silver would post a scout montage and JB would respond with a four-man grenade kill. I too continued to collect clip after clip, releasing epics such as Sharp Skills. There was a lot of artistic license. I never faked clips, but I would use clips from public servers or deathmatch. I think that everybody did back then. It wasn't easy to get a match. I reused my best clips time after time, Skill videos were still in their early stages and you could get away with murder. As the years progressed, people slowly mastered their tools. The editing became more advanced and the frags more finely spliced and set up. 
my final attempt at a skill video was C4 CSS, complete with demo smoothing and cool music, and I'm proud of it to this day. But my crowning achievement came from me releasing my first video to YouTube. A mysterious person from the comments section requested a demo, and not long afterwards, Synced was released. It was one of the biggest and best videos around, and it had my name in it. After that I stopped playing CSS, but would occasionally check up on the community. Maybe I'm just old and out of the loop, but skill videos since have become overly edited affairs where the frags themselves are less important than the editing. It's no longer a display of in-game skill as much as it is of editing and patience. Skill videos have lost their meaning. But then, did they ever have any in the first place? Everybody gets lucky rounds once in a while. You'd be a fool to think that skill can be judged from hand-selected clips collected over a long time frame. As is Toku's team's motto, consistency is the key. You're not going to win any friends by baiting your teammates to make yourself look better, unless you're get right and they're actually good at it. But despite all that, I look back fondly at the skill videos from the CSS era. They're old and dated, but they encapsulate the hopes and dreams that people had when playing and remain a lasting relic of a time long gone. CSGO has brought with it increased transparency. Within two, or god forbid, three clicks, we can watch a game from the eyes of pros. We know what the best players are capable of and what the chances of them achieving an ace are. But with that knowledge, I feel a bit of magic has been lost from the days where we only had skill videos and select demos to judge players on. We love to idolise those we imitate, to follow in the footsteps of those we feel can lead us to greatness. We all love our moment in the spotlight, and skill videos give us just that. Nobody cares about your thousands of deaths or hours of practice. During your skill video's runtime, you are superior to your foes, regardless of their rank, skill or experience. It raises you above the masses and for one brief moment, you're the star. <laughs> oh. Nice.